I have to talk about a difficult topic because it's too weak. And uh, in part, this, this topic is uh, uh, people work, like you working in gravitational wave detection, uh, is, is, is really interested in, in this topic. So I, I, I want to, uh, to give uh, some ideas about how the two tutorials will be. Uh, uh, wow. Well, tutorial one, which is today, uh, general concepts and ter terminology. So I, I will read some reference to gravitational wave uh, uh, machine learning, but very few. So if you know a lot of machine learning, so you can <laughs> skip this, this tutorial. And the second one uh, will be more focused on applications. So I will talk about mathematical background of dictionary learning, applications to the recovery of wave signals. And uh, we, we will see a step by step gravitational wave recovery from actual data. So today I started with very, very basic. Uh, uh, well, uh, Now, this is the outline for this first part. Uh, in, in, the, in the tutorial of today, I will, I will give uh, basic concepts and terminology, and then a brief introduction to neural networks. <clears throat> With the, what is machine learning? Why should we use machine learning types of machine learning strategies? Batch and online learning, instant-based versus model-based learning. Well, and the machine learning process, we have several concepts is, which are important. Uh, sometimes um, I see in the papers and physical reviews concerning machine learning for gravitational wave, I don't see uh, many uh, attention to all these concepts when they use, for instance, neural networks to do this job. So I think uh, this community needs more knowledge about uh, uh, machine learning. Uh, machine learning is the science of programming computers so they can learn from data. Uh, more engineering oriented definition, I like it, by Tom Mitchell will be, computer programming said to learn from experience E with respect to some task key and some performance measure P. If its performance on T as measured by P improves with experience E. So you can learn again and to, but uh, I give an, one example when you identify all these uh, letters. Uh, the simplest example is the spam filter. Our spam filter is a machine learning program that can learn to flag spam given examples of uh, spam emails flagged by users and examples of regular non spam emails. Then, in this case, we have a training set, the collection of given examples that the system uses to learn. Uh, each training example is called a training instance or sample. The task T is to flag a span for new emails. The experience C consists of training data. The performance P needs to be defined. It's the, 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 the hard part to, to, to define this uh, algorithm. For example, you can use the ratio of correlated classified emails over the total. This particular performance measure is called accuracy. Use it very often in classification tasks. Uh, oh, it's a little bit unstable. <laughs> uh, imagine you are playing Scrabble against a computer, an ML, a machine learning program. We might beat uh, the computer every time in the beginning. After lots of games, the computer starts beating you, until finally you never win. Conclusion, either we are getting worse or 
the machine learning program is learning how to win at Scrabble. Machine learning algorithms may learn from experience. So when the machine learning program learns to beat us, it goes on and uses the learning strategies against other players. Never seen other players, so uh, he can win other players. This is important. Uh, this this um, ma uh, machine learning strategy is called reinforcement learning. Then uh, I, I, I do a uh, one remarks about traditional programming versus machine learning techniques. An example of a spam filter using traditional programming will be, it will look at what the spam typically looks like, then we might notice that some expression like for you, our password, free credit card, amazing, tend to come up a lot in the subject. We will write a detection algorithm for each of these patterns that we notice, it, and our program will flag emails as a spam if a number of these patterns are detected. We will test our program and repeat the steps one and two until it's good enough. Since the, the problem is not trivial, our code will likely become a long list of complex roles, pretty hard to maintain. Uh, on the other hand, spam filter based on machine learning techniques automatically learns which expressions are good spam predictors by detecting unusually frequent patterns of words in the spam examples. The code is much shorter, easier to maintain, and more accurate. Then they, they, they use two rules. Every email we flag like spam is used as data to train the machine learning algorithm. Every email that we restore to the inbox because it has been incorrectly flagged as spam by the filter is also used as data to train the machine learning algorithm. Then, uh, every time we are doing these operations, uh, the, the, pro, the machine learning program is going to be uh, smarter. Uh, machine learning is uh, a great advance in scientific computing, and in particular for computational weight data. Problems in which existing solutions require a lot of, lot of hand-tuning of long list of rules. One machine learning algorithm can simplify the code and perform better. Complex problems for which there is no good solution using a traditional approach. Fluctuating, fluctuating environments, a machine learning system can adapt to new da data. Getting insights, insights uh, about complex problems and large amounts of data. This is the usual scenario we have with the gravitational wave data generated by LIGO and Virgo detectors. There are many types uh, or strategies uh, of machine learning uh, algorithms, uh, but we can classify them in general categories based on one, whether or not they are trained with human supervision, supervised and supervised, semi-supervised and reinforcement learning whether or not they can learn incrementally on the fly, online versus batch learning, whether they work by detecting patterns in the training the data and build a predictive model such as scientists do, instance, basic versus model based learning. In supervised learning, the training data uh, uh, with includes the desired solution called labels. A typical supervised learning is classification. Another typical task is to predict the target numerical value, such as the price of a car given a set of features, mileage, age, brand, called predictors. This sort of task is called regression. Uh, uh, the spam filter is a good example uh, of classification problems. It's trained with many example images along with their class. And must learn how to classify new emails. To train, M M to train a machine learning system, in these cases, we need to provide many examples. They predictors and, the, and labels. In the case of cars, they prices. <coughs> OK, I, I would like to, to know how to pass. On the top. Uh, 
Ah, ya. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, is it on the, on the right hand side? <laughs> this is new for me. Ah, okay. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, now I, I named uh, the, the following are some the most important supervised learning algorithms, not all covered in this tutorial, of course. Uh, we can mention K nearest neighbors, linear regression, logistic regression, support vector machines decision trees and random forests, and neural networks. Some neural networks, because this, this is, refers to supervised learning algorithms, and neural networks are unsupervised. For instance, uh, autoencoders and restricted Boltzmann machines. Uh, okay, now, supervised learning is, is this one, okay. Uh, our, I don't know. Uh, this, this, this is just uh, enhance or it's zooming the. the, the uh, okay. Uh, I don't know exactly in which point. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can do this, but this is ter terrible because. Well, it, do it with one finger, then it, then it does not. Ah, uh, yeah. And then, and then I do this in order to restore. Right. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, but just do it with one finger, not two. Ah, yeah. Yeah. And you oh. don't have to change oh. anything. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. It's everything new for me. <laughs> okay. Uh, unsupervised learning. The following are the most in important algorithms used uh, uh, of training data uh, unlabeled. Uh, the first one is clustering. K means hierarchical cluster analysis, HCA, expectation maximization. The second one, class dimensionality reduction, which is very important, principal component analysis, kernel PCA, locally linear embedding, anomaly detection, association rule learning. So unsupervised learning, uh, in, in this case, uh, we, we, we talk about some words about dimensionality reduction. The goal of dimensionality reduction is to simplify the data without losing too much information. It is obvious. One way to do this is to merge several correlated features into one. Dimensionality reduction can be obtained by means, by means of PCA, or singular value decomposition in terms of linear algebra. Since, I, since I, it it is an unsupervised algorithm that finds strong correlations in large dat data sets. <clears throat> Another important unsupervised task is anomaly detection. For example, detecting unusual credit card transactions to prevent fraud, catching manufacturing defects, automatically removing outliers from a data set before feeding it to another learning algorithm. The algorithm is trained with normal instances, and when it sees a new instance, it can tell whether it looks like a normal one or whether it is likely, uh, likely an anomaly. Uh, as, as you can see, these concepts uh, can be applied, I am sure, for, for many uh, situations you have in, in gravitational web uh, and data analysis. Semi-supervised learning is another interesting uh, class. Some algorithms can deal with partially labeled trainings, usually a lot of unlabeled data and a little bit of labeled data. This is semi-supervised learning. Example, some photo hosting services such as Apple iPhoto are good examples of this. We upload our family pictures to the service. Supervised part, we need to provide the algorithm with a label per person, at least in one or two or three pictures. Uh, unsupervised part, the algorithm automatically recognizes the same person A, for instance, appears in pictures 1, 3, and 12, while another person does in pictures 3, 5, and 7. Uh, usually, this use <coughs> clustering uh, 
uh, algorithms. Uh, another option is reinforcement learning, mm, ma much more difficult to uh, code. Uh, the learning algorithm called an agent, agent has the following task. It can be observed the environment. It can select and perform actions, get rewards in return, or penalties in the form of negative rewards. The so-called policy is the ability to learn by itself what is the best strategy to get the most reward over time. A policy defines what action the agent should choose when it is given in a situation. Uh, so I, I give a few, couple of examples. Many robots, of course, implement reinforced learning algorithms to learn walking or other, other uh, kind of, of uh, situations. Uh, another more, more famous is the DeepMind's AlphaGo program, which is a program to uh, play against computers or human players. Uh, and it's trained as a reinforcement learning algorithm by learning its winning policy through the analysis of millions of games and playing, playing many games against itself. AlphaZero is the last, one of the last uh, uh, breakthrough in this area. Uh, uh, Google Group uh, program learns only by playing Go or chess against itself. And uh, this was featured in a science editorial in December 2018. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Now, we want to see batch learning and online learning. In batch learning, the system is incapable of learning incrementally. That must be trained using all available data. This will generally take a lot of time and computing resources. So it is typically done offline. The offline learning works as follows. First, the algorithm is trained. Second, it's launched into production and runs without learning anymore. It just applies what it has learned. In practice, we want if, if, if we want a batch learning algorithm to know about new de data, such as a new type of span, for instance, we need to train a new version of the system from scratch on the full data set. Not just the new data, but also the old data. Then stop the old system and replace it with a new one. Oh, no, yes, this, this is no. Online learning uh, consists of the following steps. Train the algorithm incrementally by feeding new data instances sequentially. This may either individually or, or by small groups called mini batches. And each learning step is fast and cheap, so the algorithm can learn about new data on the fly as it arrives. Now we discuss instance-based versus model-based learning. One more way to categorize machine learning system is by how they generalize. Most machine learning tasks are about predictions. This means that a given number of training examples the algorithm needs to be able to generalize to cases it has never seen before. Having a good performance measure on the training data is convenient but is unsatisfactory. The true goal is to perform well on new instances. There are two main approaches to generalization, instance-based learning and model-based learning. The instance-based learning consists of an algorithm that learns the examples and then generalizes to new cases, new cases using a similarity measure. For instance, uh, instead of just flagging emails that are identical to known spam emails, the spam filter could be programmed to also flag emails that are very similar to known spam emails. This requires a measure of similarity between two emails. A very basic similarity measure between two emails could be count the number of words uh, um, they have in common. The system will flag an email as a spam. It has many words in common with a known spam. Uh, email. 
Another way to generalize, gener, gener, generalize from a set of examples is by building a model of these examples and then use the model to make prediction. This is called, called model-based learning. Here, for instance, we have a, a one a, a example uh, which is very uh, taken from one of the references I, I used, which is the uh, Aurelien Giron. It is, uh, makes a, uh, take the data from the UNESCO for taking for 45 countries for, with the gross uh, domestic product per capita, and then um, relates this with the what they call life satisfaction. So the, the, the problem is to know how as many make people happier. Then in this case, uh, linear regression so is, is uh, good enough to make a good prediction. So the goal is determined to constants which are the, the constant co corresponding to the regression, uh, the, the regression line. Uh, in gravitational wave, for instance, uh, we did uh, in our group uh, one, one, we, we will talk about that in the, the tutorial two, which was, we, we uh, classify uh, blips generated with a model. So we take three types of, of uh, functions, and, and we take one uh, sine Gaussian, Gaussian, and then something uh, similar to print down, separated. And we use uh, uh, every part of this, uh, this model to detect parts of this. Uh, and uh, in, the, in the case of dictionary learning, we will talk about, we, we ignore everything. Uh, with, uh, the, we use only one dictionary and then in a way that, the, for instance, we, we detect uh, uh, one spiral, and then the other, the other part is not, it, it doesn't exist, it's, it's noise, pure, pure noise. So we will, we will, we will explain how, how to do that. It, it, this is one example of uh, uh, <coughs> model-based learning. So we, we we go to the steps, we describe the steps we have to follow when we have a machine learning problem, either classification or regression. So data collects, so we have to follow this order. So we start with data collection and preparation. Uh, I know people not working in gravitational way, but they're doing before they choose the algorithm and then uh, adapt the data to the algorithm they, they, they have. So they, this is not good strategy to work with. So in the beginning, we have to collect clean, measure the size of the chosen data set, input data for training, and we need to collect target data for supervised learning. So feature selection, define the possible feature we want to identify. Algorithm choice, given, given a data set, choose the appropriate algorithm. So once we have studied this, the, the, the data, collection and preparation of the data set, then we choose the algorithm. Uh, then parameter and model selection. Oh. Uh, oh, what does this? <laughs> this, I don't know. Yeah, wow. Well, uh, yeah, that's... Um, then for many algorithms, there are parameters they have to, to set manually or require experimentation to identify appropriate values. For instance, in, in the case of neural networks, the hyper parameters usually are, are that, um, fitted uh, manually before they start the training, uh, the training phase. Training, given the data set algorithm, training should be simply to use computational source. This is the, the second, the, the, the part that takes more, more uh, computational cost. Uh, at the end, the evaluation, check the accuracy for the training algorithms on the validation data set. So uh, we will talk about what is the validation data set and the, everything. Oh. So we use vectors, uh, matrices, uh, input vectors, ve uh, output vectors. So 
in, in machine learning, the dimensionality of, the, of, of an input is the number of components of the vector. Sometimes dimensionality of a vector is understood as the number of components different from zero. So the important terminology is uh, vector of inputs, uh, is the data given as the one input of the algorithm where the vector is, has a m dimensions, for instance. Afterwards, we have weights, which are weighted connections that are arranged in a, in a matrix. Uh, outputs, the output vector, different dimensionality of the output, and we can write y, x, w to remind that the outputs depend on the inputs and the weights. Later on, on the neural networks, we, we, we will talk about how, how is the role of the weights. Targets, the target vector are the labels of the elements. Uh, one target corresponds to one uh, component of the, uh, of the input. Activation function, we use in neural networks. The activation is a mathematical function that describes the firing of the neuron as a response to the weighted inputs. Uh, error or cost is a function that computes the inaccuracies of the network as a function of the outputs and the targets. So, at the end, for design machine learning algorithms, the following ingredients will become essential. So, uh, apply linear algebra means the solution of large system or linear equations will be needed, uh, especially when we, we are uh, checking if our uh, strategy is good enough, it's, it's convenient to check this strategy on simple, uh, simple structure, structures, for instance, like doing, doing in, in large linear systems. Uh, Euclidean norms, another metrics to measure the closeness between outputs and targets. Non-linear activation functions, the role of this function is twofold, reduce dimensionality and classify outputs. At uh, the end, and uh, not no, no least, computational cost of the training, the highest computational cost corresponding to the training step. Overtraining and undertraining. The magic word associated to machine learning algorithms is generalization. Uh, there are many words of applications that this word doesn't appear. This, this means something that, uh, for me, something uh, is important uh, uh, omission. Our ideal goal is to make sure that we, that we do enough training so the algorithm generalizes well. There is as much danger in overtraining as there is in undertraining. If we train for too long, the, we will overfeed the, the data. Another magic word, which means that we have to learn about the noise and inaccuracies in the data. In this case, the model that we learn will be too complicated and won't be able to generalize. So uh, over, over, when we are doing uh, overtraining, so we, we, we might fall in the over, with, with output which, which will be overfit. Uh, we'll see this more. This is a simple picture to understand a little bit what is overfit when, do, when we are doing numerical approximation by functions. The effect, of, the effect of overfitting is rather than finding the generalized function, as shown in, on the left. The algorithm matches the inputs perfectly, including the noise in, in them on the right. The, the approximation on the right reduces the generalization capabilities of the function. So if we learn too much about a cloud of data, then uh, this uh, learning function uh, uh, has problems to, to make a good generalization to other cases. Testing and training, testing, and validation steps. We want to stop the learning process before the algorithm overfits. We cannot use the training data for this since, since we cannot detect overfitting. 
So if, uh, we cannot use the testing data since it is used for final test. We need a third uh, set of data for this purpose, which is called validation set, cross validation in statistics. So uh, this is uh, the validation set is the set of instances that the algorithm uh, don't, uh, don't, don't, uh, is on seeing data of the algorithm. I will see a, a scheme. So here we have, for instance, uh, the whole data set. So we make a partition of this dat data set in three pieces for training, for testing, and for, for validation. So the, the point is that we train over training and testing, and then we check if the accuracy obtained in, in the training and testing is the same order of magnitude than the, uh, the obtainer with the trainer algorithm in the validation set. We still need to work out whether or not the result is good enough after training and testing an algorithm. A method that is suitable for classification problem is the one known as the confusion matrix, which is used in some papers. Uh, the idea is the following. Let us consider a square matrix that contains all possible classes in both of the horizontal and vertical directions. Uh, 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 the element IJ of the matrix tells us how many patterns were put in the class I in the targets, but class J in the algorithm. Anything in the leading or main diagonal is correct. Suppose we have three classes. So we count the number of times that the output is class C1 when the original target was C1. Then are all well co corrected classified. Then when the target was C2, uh, the, the, this number we put in the second line. And so until the table is finished. So according to the table, most examples were classified correctly because are located on the main diagonal. But for instance, two examples of class C3 were misclassified C1. The accuracy of the classification is the ratio between the sum of the entries of the di leading diagonal over, over the sum of the all entries in the matrix. So one important uh, uh, particular class is the binary classification that considers only class C1, uh, class C2. The possible outputs of the classes can be arranged in a simple chart. C1, uh, in the main diagonal, we have true positives, true negatives, uh, fa false positives, false negatives in the secondary diagonal. True positives in observation correctly. So we, we have the same interpretation as any uh, confusion matrix. But in this case, we have names for the location of the entries. The entries in the leading diagonal are correct, and those out of the diagonals are incorrect. So. The accuracy is defined as the sum of the number of true positives and true negatives divided by the total number of examples. This is one uh, measure of accuracy. There are other measurements that can help to understand the performance of the classifier. But these metrics, sensitivity, specificity, the pre precision, recall are out of the scope of this tutorial, so this is much, much more statistics. Uh, another uh, element interesting to, for when we are addressing a classification problem is the ROC curve. We can evaluate a particular classifier or compare different classifiers, either the same classifier with different learning parameters or completely different classifier. When we have binary uh, classification algorithm. So here we have uh, what uh, appears to be the, this is uh, the ROC curve is uh, represented false, uh, false positive against true positive rate. So the, in percent, in, one, in, in, in the sum percent, so this is the curve. So a single run of the classifier represents one point of the R, R, ROC curve. So we, we, we represent in every point what, what is the result for, for the 
um, confusion matrix. We represent one point in every. So if we have a classifier uh, located at the point 0, 100, uh, means that uh, it's perfect classification. So we have no false negative. Uh, total failure will be 100, 0. So it will be over here. So uh, a reference, so I use, uh, I like to, these, these two, two reference because the, the first one is, is very uh, more elementary, so, but the, it's, a, it's a great intro, introduction. So I uh, cover a wide range of topics in depth with code examples for, for everyone written in Python using NumPy. NumPy is something very close to MATLAB. So uh, basic MATLAB. So it's very, uh, it's, it's, it's really good to, to uh, learn Python and to uh, use things that you used before, for instance, in MATLAB. The second uh, is Aurelien Geron is, uh, is much more difficult. So they, 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 they explained uh, lots of uh, very uh, uh, machine learning uh, uh, lots of examples in machine learning updated to TensorFlow 2.0. The, the, the codes presented in this book are good enough, but are more cryptic. So it's much more difficult to understand a, a Python code in, in TensorFlow that yeah. Um, hi, uh, I had a quick question about uh the ROC curve. So shouldn't the sum of um, the true positives, the false positive be one or 100% or, or is, is that not 100% because the false negatives and false, uh, sorry, uh, true negatives and true positives uh, have to be removed? Yeah, yeah. Um, what, what's happened is in the ROC curve, we, we, we uh, rescale to, uh, ROC uh, taking the, the data from the accuracy will be from zero to one. Yeah, it's, it's, it's true. So, but the, to represent in, term, in percentage, say we rescale to zero to 100. So, yeah. the, so the, this just uh, the, uh, depends on the application. So, so some, some people understand much better uh, uh, percent than per, per one. No? So, yeah. Uh Sorry, so uh, I was asking uh, also that if uh, the sum of true yeah. positive and false positive should be 100% or not uh, at any point. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah, but, but an ROC curve means that you represent, every point represents one, uh, the, the execution of one classifier different, one, one to the other. So you can compare many classifiers. If, if, if the curve you, 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 you picture in the ROC is far away uh, and the upper side of the diagonal is, is, is far away from the diagonal, then the, this means that the, the classifiers are good. Yeah. But, yeah, that, that's, that's the, the thumbs rule for the... <laughs> uh, okay. So, so you, 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 you cannot say nothing deterministic. So then you say this, this is, well, it's good enough if you have, the best one will be going, the, uh, the, 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 the axis going to zero to 100 in the, in the, in the oh, uh, and then you have the, this, but, but this is not usual. Uh, classifiers, they have uh, error and then they, they are different. So this is not important. So I think it's, it's just rescaling. So, uh, okay. And you, you, you can fill this ROC depending on the, the, what you want to compare. So even if you take only one classifier for, for different uh, uh, hyperparameters. So it's, 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 it's a lot of things. Just, just, I, I explain this just to say that this one tool in order to explain much better what's going on with those classifiers. So how okay, to... Okay. So the, the, that's the point. Okay, <laughs> no, I, okay, yeah. I, 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 of course, there is a much more things about the statistics. <laughs> I think, so. Okay, so, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So 
Well, with this, I uh, finish my, the first part of the talk, which is general concept. And, uh, and then I, I, I pass to uh, mm, to the, the other one. It is a brief introduction to neural networks. Uh, OK. How? Antonio, actually, I have a question for you. Yeah. When you show the confusion matrix, yeah. there is an assumption there that every time you have uh, the true label, let's say C1, mm. you are getting an outcome uh, which is uh, C1, right? Mm -hmm. And C2, you get C2 all the time. Now, for highly nonlinear systems, that may not be true, right? You can have chaotic systems so since your labeling is uh, is discrete. So, yeah, the, the yeah, I think people I, think about this yeah, or uh, well, I I I never try a very nonlinear problem, so pro probably. Uh, doesn't work, or maybe in some, some statistic, books of statistics is discussed. It. So I, I don't know how to, to answer your question. So maybe maybe it's not uh, good enough to, 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 to give uh, a good evaluation of the classifier. When, when you are classifying things that are very nonlinear uh, correlated, or, so yeah, I think it's so. So uh, usually, when I when I have this kind of doubt, so I use I, I like to use uh, PCA or a, a singular value decomposition, which is the unsupervised tool in machine learning to know which is a strong correlated and which is not a strong correlated. So this is a it's a, it's a good tool to analyze your, your data before you are going far away with other with neural networks or other kind of things. So th this is my, my point of view for, uh, following my experience of this. So I, I don't know how to answer your questions, but it's, it's good enough. I have also a second question for you. Well, so you mentioned anomaly detections, yeah. supervised anomaly detection. So the methods I see uh, I saw, assume that uh, you know what the normal is, right? right? So, in a certain sense, you have to train a little bit and tell, tell the algorithm this is normal, and so you can detect an anomaly. <laughs> now, have, ever, have you seen any, any methods or algorithms where you can start doing anomaly detection without knowing what the normal is? So, it will take some time to learn. Yeah, I, I understand. Yeah, that's true. But you start from from scratch. So, for example, in one year time, we'll turn on the interferometer, mm -hmm. and uh, we don't know what the normal is for the new interferometer, right? Yeah. Uh, is, is there an unsupervised anomaly detection mechanism that learns uh, what the normal is before learning what an anomaly is? Uh, you, you have to inform to the algorithm what, what kind of patterns you, you want to look at, in a way. So depend on the algorithm. So uh, usually, uh, instant, because this is, will be instance-based uh, learning. Uh, instance-based learning, in general, should be less, uh, you, have le you have more uncertainty, in a way. So yeah, you, you cannot say that, well, you have to to know what you are looking for. So normal uh, normal patterns according to not everything. So you know the normal signal detected in one. So I, I don't know. So you have to to tell the algorithm what you want to see, and perhaps uh, detect something. <laughs> I don't know this. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, so you mentioned that you divide your data into three sets, the training, the testing, and the validation. Is there like a standard where people, you know, separate maybe like 30% for testing, or does it depend on the problem itself? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. The, the, now when I explain the, the neural network, you will see what, what, what's going on. 
But uh, in, in the beginning, when we take the, your whole that data, the, the simplest way is to do testing, per, sorry, training and validation. And you, are, you avoid testing. So the, this is a, a small complicated procedure of inference, a statistical inference. So uh, you train the algorithm on the training data set, which is larger than the other one. And you, you arrive to some accuracy, for instance. And then uh, you, you, you check your fitted algorithm on the validation set. And then if you see that the accuracy, the, 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 the number of cases you yeah, are, 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 are OK, uh, is similar to, to the one you, are, you obtain in the training set, then you see the the, the algorithm is well trained. So generalize well, because they get the same accuracy on the training set and on the validation set, because the validation set is the set of instances the, the, the algorithm never seen. So the, the, that's the point. So if you, if you get this uh, thumbs roll, you can ensure that you don't have overfit. So this is a thumbs rule in order to avoid overfitting, to get the same accuracy uh, you obtain after the training. Uh, and then you take the training algorithm and you check how accuracy you get on the validation set. So this is the normal uh, strategy is used in, a, in, a, in neural networks, for instance. So no, many papers don't, don't, don't care about that especially for applications, because they, they have more, more difficult problems. But, but you have to ensure this, because with, with uh, gravitational wave data, it's difficult to know if you have or not overfitting. So <laughs> overfitting is something um, elusive, in a way. Uh, OK. The other one. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, 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 wow. Uh, now, we have here uh, what we talk about, bio biological and artificial neurons, simple samples of neural networks, activation functions, elements of neural networks, stochastic gradient descent, and reference and links. Uh, it's impossible to, in one, our, uh, well, we have, maybe I can take some more minutes. So to, to talk about all the topics, all, all the things about this. So I, I like to start with, because we, until now was all, everything literature. So now I want to, to get some pictures. <laughs> so the first picture is probably one of the first Selfies, the first selfie, selfies in the history. This, this guy is, is the father of the neuroscience, which is, was Cajal, uh, uh, was a, a, a scientist uh, winning the, the Nobel Prize uh, in the beginning of. So, but Cajal was professor of the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Valencia, was, 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 was the, the first position they got the afterward was Madrid because you know in, in Europe everything is centralized so they are poor. But, but the first place was this and then is in the, his laboratory and takes his own picture. So was a selfie, well selfie in a way. Okay, this just something written in me. Uh, Cajal read, uh, writes some uh, drawings that makes him Famous is in a museum. So uh, analyze how it works the neurons. And then uh, after some decades, that arrives the anatomy uh, structure of a biological neuron was composed by dendrites, cell body, action, and action potential. Means the dendrites show the is the input of the cell. This is the neuron. This is the dendrites. Is, is the uh, signals coming 
from, from, from other networks. Uh, and then <clears throat> the cell body is charged with cell voltage until the voltage crosses some threshold. And then uh, if crosses this, uh, this threshold, then some signal is going to, through the axon, to, to go to other neurons. So this is the original one. So if you want to explain this, oh, what happened? Ah. Uh, so this receives inf information from many other neurons from the dendrites. Aggregate this information. At that time, at the beginning, they don't know how to aggregate this information via changes in the cell voltage in the, in the cell body. And then there, there was a nonlinear step. Simple. Transmit a signal if the cell voltage crosses the threshold level, a, uh, a signal that can be received by many other neurons of the, uh, the, uh, in the network. So here the only thing is not clear is how to aggregate this information. So the first guy proposing a model was Frank Rosenblatt in 1958, uh, uh, which, which is the, the, the mod, percept, perceptron model. Perceptron model. You have the same idea: is there are inputs, the neuron, and outputs, uh, and then how how this is is works. Uh, re, it's the same steps. Except the linear step, there is a linear step which is a specification what are doing with aggregation of information. So receive input from multiple other neurons, from the dendrites in the case, biological neurons. Linear step, aggregate those inputs via a simple arithmetic operation called weighted sum. We talk about that. And nonlinear step, generate an output. If this weighted sum crosses a threshold level, I put before which can be sent to many other neurons. So it's uh, specify what I'm doing this. So the basic, op basic operation, so to perform weighted sum means is uh, you have n inputs x, i, the uh, sum weights corresponding to, to some line of input, which is the weight. Then the binary, binary output of the perceptron can be described as follows. If weighted sum is strictly larger than threshold, then output is one. If it's less or equal, the threshold, then the output is zero. So why we can write the weighted sum in a short way with this uh, kind of these things. And when we define uh, the the the, the the parameter B, which is called the bias, as the minus the threshold, in order to put everything in one side and compare everything with zero. So uh, then we can write, can write the perceptron in concise rotation. It is strictly positive W plus bias. Uh, output one uh, is, is strictly positive, and in the other case is output negative. So here we go to half. Mm, uh, elementary neural networks so, with layers. So here we have this, the first layer is the input layer and the last one is the output. And in the middle we can have several layers with called hidden layers. When we have more than three, three or more la hidden layers, we, we people consider the, the, the network is deep. So just having three or more. So activation function. Uh, we write a weight exam in this way. Then what is the activation function? It's a function sigma, which is a nonlinear real value function, which range is either 0, 1, or minus 1, 1. Uh, and has the only argument, uh, the value set of the uh, weighted sum plus the bias. Then, uh, uh, in a way, when doing this, this uh, activation, you have, so we are associate to every neuron, we apply this function, 
is a probability between 0 and 1, or sometimes from minus 1 to 1, depending on the, on the, the problem. But uh, everything scaled in from 0 and 1 or minus 1, 1, uh, everything works uh, uh, numerically much better than other, other things. Even the input data can be, um, it's recommended to rescale to, to be in between 0 and 1. So the step function is, of course, uh, uh, is, is a activation function, which is, this, uh, see, if it is associated to one neuron, in this case, a step neuron is a perceptron. But they, they uh, have a binary response, 0 of 1. Uh, sigmoid function, then instead of uh, giving a zero one binary response, is giving a probability distribution between zero and one. Uh, sometimes depend on, on this. Uh, the other one is a parabolic tangent between minus one and one, sometimes corresponding to this kind of things. And then at the end, rectified linear unit function, which is almost linear, linear for positive numbers and zero. Uh, for negative. Uh, there are thousands of activation for some modification of this. So relus, you, you, you might find a lot of them, it, depending on the problem, works much better. Or, so this is one of the things you have to think about when you, you are, you, you are you're trying to design a neural network. So list of components of a neural network. Of course, at the beginning, neurons, which can be of type sigmoid, hyperbolic tangent, or relu. Cost functions, the most popular are uh, quadratic cost or cross entropy. The, uh, now, now we'll see what is the, the role of this, uh, each one. Uh, then we need a, a gradient descent method which, which has a stochastic component. Uh, I will explain why this stochastic component is added this in order to, to, get, to, to get good training. And the trained neural network uh, doesn't overfit. So avoid overfits or uh, prevents. So back propagation, so because we, we, uh, we will use gradient descent, Gradient descent means that you have to, to compute uh, gradients of the, so uh, in a neural network, the input is, the, uh, is, is fitted with all the, the, your data set, and the uh, weights and bias are the uh, unknowns. So we have to fit a big amount of uh, parameters so the weights and bias, uh, for all the, the inputs in the data set uh, in a way that we minimize the cost. So, well, layers. You can, you can use dense, convolutional, softmax. Well, two words about dense and convolutional. Dense means that you have a, a to fit a lot of weights. It's the, the, the worst case from the point of view of uh, how the code is, is big. So people, when you have your data is, is uh, the high dimensional, they, they use, usually use convolutional, because convolutional are a kernel very uh, small, and they use very few weights compared with the dense case. Softmax was is a, is, a, is a kind of uh, of a, a final uh, processing to the output layer in order to assign <coughs> a probability to every item in the. Well, there is a important also the initialization, which is the so four years ago I discovered that the the, the people use. Uh, Mm, random initialization. But if you use random initialization without caring about that, so you 
you might you might get that your in your training process the the neurons are saturated and going to go to CO and one. So they were truncated Gaussian, which is discovered by Glorot and Benjamin, and then they proposed something that works very well. So at the end, I, there is another thing, which is dropout, which means uh, and data augmentation, which prevents or eliminates the overfitting. OK. Not that much. So. Oh. Cost functions. Neural networks may address two kinds of problems, classification and regression. Uh, given target vectors, I Y define the desired labels for the outputs and given the estimated output vectors through the neural network, then the regression problems, the appropriate cost function uh, should be quadratic cost. It's the same as least square, but in this uh, huge <laughs> estimation. Uh, the output approximates what is called the learning function. We will define this. Defined by the forward phase of the already trained neural network predicting the targets. Uh, concerning classification problems, the appropriate cost function is the cross entropy cost. The cross entropy cost uh, is, is much better because uh, <coughs> uh, this is this uh, uh, energy is based on the Shannon theory of information that, that minimizing this function. So uh, from the theory of information, that we, uh, we are reducing the uncertainty contained in the, in the signal. So well, uh, the mathematical analysis explanation is the cross entropy is structured so that when we calculate these derivatives with respect to the weights, related to the difference between the target and the estimate. Then the greater difference gives a larger variation of this derivative with respect to the weights, and then the, the, the neurons learn faster. So the, 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 the classification problems are much faster, learn much faster than the regression problems. Uh, OK. So, the parameters to be fitted are the weights and the bias, are the unknowns. We define the learning function as its argument is the input vector, as the predicted value computed from the input vector. So uh, doing forward propagation, you, take the, the, you want to, to get the value of the, uh, the learning function, so you take the one sample of data, and then you, you go through all the, the from, from left to the right, to, when, according to our picture, uh, and then at the end you get one output, uh, estimated output, and this estimated output is the value of the so-called, or I, I call, learning function. Uh, the learning function is the composition of a chain of functions. Uh, as a mathematician, I have to, to say that. Each one corresponds to the evaluation of activation function applied to the weighted sum of neuron values of a layer. Indeed, f is a continuous piecewise linear function on a cube of Rm, and each graph is a surface made up of many flat pieces, uh, when used ReLU, for instance. Uh, and it appears a kind of origami with some flat pieces going to infinity. Uh, some uh, mathematical historical no, uh, related to this. Uh, the, the, why the neural networks uh, are so successful? From the mathematical point of view, is because the, uh, the learning function is a composition of uh, a continuous uh, uh, composition functions of linear. So, the, the operation of composition in mathematics is very, is very powerful to approximate functions. Uh, uh, a famous generalization of the 13 problem of Hilbert in the list of 23 unsolved problems was if A is every, well, this say one mathematical problem, is every continuous function of three variables uh, is the composition of continuous function G1, G2, final number of two variables. 
So this is what the, the uh, reduce the, pro the 13 problem of Hil Hilbert list. So the answer is yes. And the positive answer was given in 1957 by Vladimir Arnold, age 19. This, his teacher was Andrei Kolmogorov. Well, uh, maybe Dima can pronounce much better the Russian. <laughs> but we are interested in the design of neural networks for gravitational wave, and this, uh, our pur main purpose is to classification. Gradient the stain. And uh, on time? Yeah, it's okay. It's no, but, okay. no, but uh, I have three or four. Yeah, ten, you have 10 minutes. Okay. So I, 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 I make my mathematical <laughs> observation. So the, the, this, this topic of the 13 problem, they, they have a lot, a lot of things from the mathematical point of view. So it's, it's really interesting. Uh, gradient is the, 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 the algorithm to, to minimize uh, the cost function. Uh, is the fundamental in training deep neural network. It's based on the iterative procedure defined by, uh, here we write the evolution of the gradient strain with, with the weights and with the, with the bias. Uh, this we have one, where SK is the learning rate, K is, is the, 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 the number of iterations. And we expect convergence when WK tends to W uh, uh, star and BK V star, where the cost function is minimized for the training data and testing data. So, in general, what happened? Large network, we have large network, many unknown weights. So, this is the, 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 the usual problem. Uh, many samples in the training set. Well, maybe. So, at, at this moment, the catalogs of waveforms are not too big. No. Well, then gra gradient descent iteration is not successful. We remark that under Babo conditions, computing derivatives is expensive, too expensive, in spite that, easy to compute. And the training network can give poor results on seen test. Conclusion, the learning function in this case can fail to generalize. <clears throat> the stochastic gradient stain uses not the full batch of training data, but the n mini batch of samples of training data. Uh, the the mini, batch, uh, mini batches is a partition of the training data set uh, with a size much more smaller than the full data set. Then I, I will explain in a few words how, how it's working this. Uh, we choose a small mini watt size at the full book is in pieces. So uh, there is two iterations, one uh, outer iteration and the other one inner one. The outer one is, a, uh, is one iteration of the outer one is called epoch. And the inner one is called steps, which is the steps of the, the gradient descent. So we start with the first epoch, and then we have a, the set of mini batches of the training set. We reorder the list of mini batches in a random order. Then we perform what is called a round of training. Round of training means that I apply a gradient stand on this mini batch only. So sample of mini batch for work propagate X through network to estimate. Uh, the target with uh, uh, y hat, calculate the cost comparing y and y hat, there's the gradient of c to adjust w and b, enabling, uh, uh, enabling x to, in this mini batch, to better predict y computing derivatives with bad propagation. The derivatives of the, uh, of the gradient in, in a neural network uh, has to be computed with respect to all the weights. Some weights are in the, in the first, uh, the, the, the closest hidden layer to the output one. And the other one are uh, in the beginning. 
So when we compute the, uh, we, we, we can do a recurrent chain rule because we, you apply chain rule, you, you only have to compute derivatives, derivatives of the weighted sums and, and the activation functions. And then the, the total derivative for, for, for any weight is a product of derivatives corresponding in one of the layers. So it's possible it's to explain this with details and put in equations and things like that. But you understand more or less. You, you know, at the beginning, some engineers were trained said they, 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 they don't apply the chain rule, so they, they have a lot of problems to compute that at the beginning when the, this theory starts to, to work computationally. So, uh, repeat the round of training, a fixed number of iterations. So, we fix the number of iterations of uh, gradient descent. But we now, that we take a fix, but when we finish the epoch, we start another epoch, and then all, the epoch uh, ha, a, applies for all mini batches the gradient descent. And the gradient descent is computed in a, a small mini batch, a small sample of data. Uh, sample the new one and repeat this process to complete one epoch without repetition. So, uh, in this way, uh, we have uh, here, when you start a new epoch, we, we reorder again mini batches. So, we, we, we are not working with the same order we use in the first one. So, we apply random uh, order in every epoch. But when you are adjusting uh, WB and W and B, for the next mini batch, you use the one you have already obtained, or you get new values. Uh, I uh, I adjust W and B in a mini batch. The next one uh, in the on the list of the random list I choose. Then I I, I use these numbers if I need. so if 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 they are. Uh, if they are connected with, with the network. So I update, because at the beginning I need to initialize every value. So you, you, I do this with, with uh, in, in taking a distribution, which is the Glorod one, which is one preventing the, the saturation of ne neurons. So, uh, so you, you are updating, you, you go through all the mini batches and then finish the POC, and then you can uh, estimate at the end of the epoch how accuracy you get in this epoch, uh, counting the numbers of, uh, yeah, you know, in the training set. You are, we are now only on the training set because on the, the 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 validation set, if this is not or the testing set, this is not no not made. You are, we are not training the validation set. You just take the training, the trained uh, network, and we apply it to the data on the validation set and count, the, uh, you, you estimate the accuracy. No? Then, okay, how, well, how, how is the, it's, it's much more difficult in this so general case to, to, to analyze why uh, mm, the random component of the algorithm makes things to work better. In the general case, uh, the the reason is always you get a simple example. So. One way to to do this is possible to, for instance, you you, you know, uh, I'm sure you know the Gauss ideal method to iterative method to solve uh, linear linear systems. Uh, there, there is another one which is the Kasmar one, which is not very popular. Was one Polish mathematician from, from the 30s. So the you, you you might program this kind of uh, algorithms, and these algorithms can be Randomize, but by, by if you want to 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 work with a big linear system, so 
you take mini batches, and then you not mini batches. In this case, the mini batch size is one, because Gauss Seidel and Kasmar act only on one equation. The next one uh, it, uh, takes what you obtained in the, the the one before. So uh, if you you program this, you see uh, that you you get a really good, uh, for instance, to, to solve uh, uh, normal equations in a least square problem, which is a symmetry, things like that. So it's, but when, when the matrix is too big, you have ill conditioning. So it, uh, you, you might fight uh, against ill conditioning using randomness. So, the, so the, then uh, you think that you translate to this, which is a more complicated case, that is a good uh, uh, ingredient to, to work with. Uh, the second thing is that usually the cost function might be non-convex. So the solution is not unique. But the, uh, introducing the, the, the cost function, the, the function in total. So uh, the point is that the Introducing the uh, random names, you might go from one step for the other, uh, and you you can avoid uh, to be a trap trapped by a local minima. So this is another thumb rule. <laughs> this is is not a proof. This is all ma not mathematics. It's just experience. So I'm sure there will be mathematics behind. Okay. Uh, then the success of deep learning using st uh, gradient, stochastic gradient descent rates on two facts. Computing the gradient by using back propagation, recurrent chain rule, on the mini batch samples is much faster than the one on the full batch. The, doing this procedure, uh, stochastic gradient descent produce weights that also succeed on unseen data. Uh, this, this means that generalize well. Well, but you have to check the generalize well with, by, by checking the accuracy and the data and the, and the training that data set and the other one. Following the general rules, the inference explain it to avoid overfitting to get satisfactory generalization is the thumbs rule is early stopping. At the beginning, this works with, with uh, very efficiently, but Arise one moment that is going to be uh, not not so. But the, the, the way you can control if you are work, if the training is working is by if doing too much epochs that uh, the accuracy in the training set is going up or going down the, the grades, and you cannot uh, match this accuracy with the validation. So the, the, the thumbs rule is to stop when you see balanced accuracy in both sets. This is the inference. Then you avoid overfitting. Well, I have no proof of this. Uh, so oh, the, this is the last one. Hyperparameters of a neural network will be. Uh, uh, the long train and test data, number of hidden layers and their dimensions. Usually, the hidden layers are all have the same dimension. Uh, th this is the usual one, except the sp specific problems. Activation fashion chosen for the neurons in hidden layers. Dropout use. We will talk about dropout use in the next uh, tutorial. Cost optimizer. Which cost use? Optimizer usage it is possible to use stochastic gradient descent, but the, the gradient descent have other algorithms which are more ac accurate, uh, are second order or third order. And uh, you have one of the uh, world experts in this is Nesterov. There is one, one which is called Nesterov Adam, which is second order. There is thinking about third order. The idea of the the the, so the idea of the um, gradient descent 
is to avoid the computation of second derivatives or third derivatives. So because this is too much costly compared with the first one. So there are second order methods, third order methods, where we use uh, finite, uh, uh, finite difference in a way. So because it is much easier. Uh, and there exists uh, chain rules for finite difference. So in a, well, uh, another important is a Hura symmetric usage. Uh, mini batch size. So you change one of these hyperparameters, the, the, the training can be good, very good, going to a disaster. Uh, number of mini batches, number of epochs, which is uh, usually take fix, and number of steps of the gradient descent on each mini batch. So those are the, the topics there. So uh, I could recommend some reference. This is the classic one, one I fell of Joseph Bingo. Uh, there, there is one update online, this deep learning. Uh, uh, from the point of view of, there is a very, very nice paper, the Jan Lecun, Benjo, and Hinton were the three, the, the, the three one winning the Turing Prize in the nature uh, paper explaining the state of the art. Uh, uh, I follow uh, O'Reilly online courses of deep learning, one of my own, and then I have some ideas I, I take from, from this, of course. Uh, there is a tutorial you, you can see in your uh, home, which is by three blue, one brown. There are many tutorials for one. This is one for the explaining the, how to, uh, the idea how to train. Uh, uh, and there is a playground, playground neural network, which you, you can use uh, different uh, modifying the hyperparameters and see how it's working. So it is, looks this because you, do, you don't need to code. Okay? So that's all what I, <laughs> I wanted to say. Thank you. <laughs>